We're continuing our discussion of Lie groups and Lie algebras. In the previous couple videos, we found the Lie group matrices for rotations of spin 0, spin 1 half, and spin 1 particles. And in this video, we're going to come up with a general procedure for finding the Lie group matrices that rotate higher spin particles, such as spin 3 halves, spin 2, and all higher spin particles. This procedure will involve the latter operators. We're going to see that the SO3 group only has representations for integer spin particles. If we want to find representations for half integer spin particles as well, we need to look at its double cover, SU2. Before I talk about the procedure with the latter operators, I'm going to be more formal about some definitions in representation theory, because I've been sort of glossing over them in previous videos. So I've already mentioned that a group is a set with an operation that obeys these four properties. Closure, associativity, existence of an identity element, and existence of inverses. Lie groups have the additional property of being continuous. So what is the formal definition of a representation of a group? A representation is a function rho that takes every member in a group G and assigns it to an invertible n by n matrix. So rho is a function from the group G to GLN, the general linear group of invertible n by n matrices. In order to be a representation, this function rho must preserve the group operation for all members in the group. This means that combining two group elements and then getting its representation matrix is the same thing as getting the representation matrices for both group members and then multiplying the matrices. A consequence of this is that the group's identity element must be mapped to the n by n identity matrix. And group inverse elements must be mapped to the corresponding representation matrix's inverse. Now, with Lie groups like SU2 and SO3, the groups are defined in terms of matrices to begin with. For example, SU2 is defined as the set of 2x2 two two complex unitary matrices with determinant 1. We call these matrix definitions the defining representation of the group. But we can find matrices of other sizes that satisfy the conditions of a representation. For example, it's possible to map all SU2 matrices to a set of 4x4 four four matrices which obey all the same matrix multiplication rules. It's also possible to map pairs of SU2 matrices each to an SO3 matrix. So the group SO3 is a 3x3 three three representation of SU2. Some of the group structure is forgotten here because it's an irreversible 2 to 1 mapping. The 1x1 one one representation of SU2 sends all matrices to the 1x1 one one identity matrix. Here, all the group structure is forgotten, but it still technically preserves all the multiplication rules. We can also define representations for Lie algebras, which is a function pi that sends Lie algebra members to n by n matrices. Here the function pi must preserve the Lie bracket of the algebra. Now I mentioned we can find a 4x4 four four representation of the Lie group SU2, but we've never seen this before. How would we go about finding this 4x4 four four representation? Well, there's one way of getting a 4x4 four four representation that's sort of cheating. We could take a pair of 2x2 two two SU2 matrices and take their direct sum, which means arranging them in block diagonal form so that the first one transforms the top two components of a column, and the second one transforms the bottom two components of a column. When multiplying block diagonal matrices like this, the upper blocks will only multiply with upper blocks, and the lower blocks will only multiply with lower blocks. So it's like we've put two independent copies of SU2 into the same matrix. This would satisfy the requirements of a 4x4 four four representation. Alternatively, we could take a 3x3 three three representation and the 1x1 one one representation and arrange them in block diagonal form. When we construct a representation using smaller representations with the direct sum to give a matrix in block diagonal form, 
we call this representation reducible. If a representation cannot be written as a direct sum, then we call it an irreducible representation, or irrep for short. In this video, we're interested in finding irreducible representations, or irreps. So we're ignoring the case of building representations from smaller representations using the direct sum. We'll see later that for the SU2 group, there is exactly one unique representation for a given matrix size. We can label these representations by the matrix size n, also called the dimension. We can also label these representations by the spin value, which is the dimension minus 1 divided by 2. We're also going to prove that the SO3 group only has odd dimensional representations, or equivalently, only integer spin representations. So before we learn the procedure for building general representations of SU2, we're going to spend some time studying the 2 by 2 or spin 1 half representation. We'll start with the spin 1 half representation of the SU2 Lie algebra. Then we'll define the ladder operators, and from there we'll generalize the ladder operators to any spin and use them to build all higher dimensional representations. We've seen that one way to get Lie group matrices is to take a basis of generators from the group's Lie algebra and exponentiate them. We know the three 2 by 2 generators for SU2 are given by negative 1 half times pairs of sigma matrices. These give a basis for 2 by 2 traceless anti-Hermitian matrices. I'm now going to introduce the raising and lowering operators G plus and G minus which are also called ladder operators. Recall that the spin up spinner state is represented by the column 1, 0, and the spin down spinner state is represented by the column 0, 1. We'll define the raising operator as changing the down state into the up state, and changing the up state into the 0 spinner. We'll define the lowering operator as changing the up state into the down state, and changing the down state into the zero spinner. The raising operator G plus is given by the matrix 0, 1, 0, 0, and the lowering operator G minus is given by the matrix 0, 0, 1, 0. You can see they obey the expected properties. Given the SU2 generators, to build G plus, we can split it into symmetric and anti-symmetric parts. Then, if we pull out a factor of negative i, we can see that we can rewrite g plus as i times g y z minus g z x. We can do something similar with g minus to write it as i times g y z plus g z x. I'm going to define one last operator g z. When this acts on the up state, it returns plus one half times the up state. When it acts on the down state, it returns minus one half times the down state. In other words, the up and down states are eigenvectors of the GZ operator, with eigenvalues plus one half and minus one half. In this basis, the GZ matrix would be diagonal, with entries plus one half and minus one half. This matrix is simply equal to I times GXY. Also, it's very common to label the up and down states after their eigenvalues under GZ. So the up state could be labeled with plus one half, and the down state could be labeled with minus one half. This is related to why we call the 2 by 2 representation the spin one half representation. The reason I'm calling this matrix GZ is because this is the matrix physicists use when measuring the spin angular momentum of a particle along the Z axis, or equivalently the XY plane. It's also worth noting that since GXY is anti-Hermitian, then GZ must be Hermitian. This implies all the eigenvectors of GZ are orthogonal. So the eigenvectors of GZ give us an orthogonal basis. So using our original SU2 basis, we've defined three new operators. 
the raising operator G plus, the lowering operator G minus, and the eigenvalue operator GZ. Note that, since we define these raising and lowering operators using complex coefficients, this means we are leaving the SU2 Lie algebra and going to its complexified version. Also, since most physics textbooks use Hermitian matrices for the SU2 generators, you might find the definition of these operators look a little different, but they behave the same way. Now, let's look at the commutators of these three matrices. To help compute these, I'm going to look at some properties of the commutator. The commutator of matrices X and Y is XY minus YX. Notice that if we swap the order of the commutator inputs, we get a negative sign compared to the original commutator. This also means the commutator of any matrix with itself is always zero, since the two terms cancel. Now let's look at linearity properties. Let's say we have matrices X, Y, Z, and scaling numbers A and B and we want to determine the commutator of Z and AX plus BY. We can write out the commutator as the subtraction of the two products. After distributing, we can factor out A from the Z and X terms and factor B from the Z and Y terms. These then become the ZX and ZY commutators. So what we've learned here is that the second input in the commutator bracket is linear. We can either add and scale matrices inside the commutator input, or add and scale the commutators of the individual matrices, and get the same result. The first input of the commutator also obeys the linearity property, so we say the commutator is bilinear. I'm now going to compute the commutator of G plus and G minus. You can pause now if you want to try it yourself. First, we sub in their definitions, and then use linearity rules once, and then twice, to get four terms. The commutator of a term with itself is always zero, so the first and fourth terms go to zero. We can put the factors of i out in front, and swap the order of the inputs in the first remaining commutator if we change its sign. We end up with 2i times the commutator of gyz and gzx, which we know is gxy. And using the definition of gz, this gives us 2gz. You can also pause and try to calculate the commutator of gz and g+, with the answer being g+. And calculating the commutator of gz and g minus, the answer ends up being negative g minus. So we have this new basis of the complexified Lie algebra SU2, and this gives us a new set of commutators. So what was the point of this change of basis? Well, we know gz acting on the plus one half state gives eigenvalue plus one half and gz acting on the minus one-half state gives an eigenvalue of minus one-half. We can summarize this by saying gz acting on the m state gives an eigenvalue of m. But what happens if we have gz acting on the state g plus times the m state? We can take the product gz times g plus and see it in this commutation relation. This means we can replace it with the commutator of gz and g plus, added with g plus times gz. We know from previous slides that this commutator just gives g plus, and when gz acts on the m state, it gives the eigenvalue m. We can then factor out g plus from these terms and get m plus one out in front. What this means is that we can treat g plus times the m state as a new eigenvector of the gz operator and it has eigenvalue m plus 1. This makes sense given what we expect from the raising operator. It should raise us from the minus 1 half state to the plus 1 half state, thereby increasing the eigenvalue by 1. Now, recall that the g plus operator will send the vector with the highest eigenvalue to 0. This is true in the 2x2 two two representation, but it's true in any finite dimensional representation, because we'll eventually run out of basis vectors to raise at some point. 
We call the basis vector that g plus sends to zero the vector with the highest eigenvalue. We sometimes call eigenvalues weights in this context, so this is also called the eigenvector with the highest weight. We can do something similar with the lowering operator g minus, except this time the commutator gives negative g minus, and so we end up with an eigenvalue of m minus one. Again, this makes sense. We expect the lowering operator to decrease the eigenvalue of a state by one except in the case of the lowest eigenvalue or lowest weight vector, which gets sent to zero. It turns out that if the highest eigenvalue is j, then the lowest eigenvalue will be minus j. I'll prove this a bit later in the video. So let's think carefully about what we've just seen with these eigenvalue relations. Thinking in terms of any dimension, not just the two by two representation. When we applied gz to the state g plus on m, we got an eigenvalue of m plus one. So this means that the g plus on m state behaves like the state m plus one. However, since the state appears on both sides of the equation, we have only showed that g plus on m is proportional to the state m plus one. They are not necessarily equal. They are only equal up to some scaling factor alpha. Similarly with the g minus case, the state g minus on m behaves like the state m minus one, and is proportional according to some proportionality constant beta. Now to solve for alpha and beta, I'm going to make the assumptions that the eigenvectors of gz that we're working with are all normalized. So the bra ket inner product of any gz eigenvector with itself always equals one. To get the norm of g plus on m, we use its corresponding bra vector, which is its Hermitian conjugate. This equals the bra version of m times g plus dagger. Now let's take their inner product. We know g plus raises the state to m plus one, with a proportionality constant alpha for the ket vector. g plus dagger should do the same thing on the bra vector but it gives the proportionality constant of alpha complex conjugate instead. This is because the Hermitian conjugate of a scalar is just the complex conjugate. Putting the scalars out in front, alpha conjugate times alpha is just the squared magnitude of alpha. And since these state vectors are normalized, we just get one. So we've shown that the squared norm of the g plus on m state is the magnitude of alpha squared. We can similarly show that the squared norm of the g minus on m state is the magnitude of beta squared. So let's calculate g plus dagger g plus by plugging in its definition. We can pass the dagger to all the terms inside the brackets, which also flips the sign of the complex i. If we distribute the four terms, we can write minus i times i as one. Now we know all the SU2 generators are anti-Hermitian, so the dagger operation just gives a minus sign. With what's left, we get negative gyz squared minus gzx squared, minus i times this commutator, which we know is just gxy. And we know i times gxy is the definition of our eigenvalue operator gz. We can do a similar calculation for g minus dagger g minus. The only difference is that gz has a plus sign instead of a minus sign. So we have these two formulas. To understand these formulas better, I'm going to talk about the Casimir operator g squared, which is defined as the negative squares of the SU2 generators summed together. G squared is important because it commutes with everything in the Lie algebra. This G squared operator is not a member of the Lie algebra SU2, because the Lie algebra doesn't understand what squaring matrices means. Lie algebras only understand the Lie bracket, or commutator. The Casimir operator G squared instead lives in the universal enveloping algebra, but I'm not going to talk about that in this video. To prove that g squared commutes with everything, I'm going to go over a couple more properties of the commutator. First, the commutator of a with a squared 
always goes to zero because the two terms cancel. Also, the commutator obeys a kind of product rule. If we take the commutator of A with B times C, we can subtract and add BAC in the middle and get a sum of two commutators, one with B and one with C. Using this, we can prove GXY commutes with G squared. We can write out the definition of G squared and then distribute. We know the commutator involving only GXY goes to zero automatically. The other two terms can be evaluated using product rule, giving two terms each. We can rewrite these commutators as GZX and GYZ. Working out the signs, all the terms cancel, and we see the commutator goes to zero. We can use similar proofs to show that G squared commutes with the other two basis vectors, and so commutes with every element of SU2. So knowing the definition of G squared, and also the GZ operator, we can move GXY squared over to the other side, and rewrite it in terms of GZ. Finally, we can take the G plus and G minus formulas from before, and rewrite the GYZ and GZX parts, using G squared and GZ instead. So now these products are written entirely in terms of G squared and GZ. So what does this Casimir operator G squared give when it acts on the vector m? Well, let's take m to be the highest weight vector, labeled j. Remember, this is the vector that g plus sends to zero. So if we apply g squared to the highest weight vector j, the g plus acting on the vector j will immediately go to zero. And gz will simply return the eigenvalue j. So gz squared plus gz just gives us j squared plus j, which can be rewritten as j times j plus one. So knowing this, let's use the lowering operator to see how g squared acts on the j minus one vector. We can replace the j minus one vector with g minus acting on the j vector divided by beta. However, since g squared commutes with all the other g's, we can flip their order and get it to act on the j vector, giving j times j plus one. We can then use the lowering operator to return the j state to the j minus one state. So because g squared commutes with everything, it also returns j times j plus one when acting on the j minus one vector. And by induction, g squared returns j times j plus one on all other eigenvectors of gz. When a representation has highest weight j, we call it the spin j representation. This is why the two by two representation is called the spin one half representation. So we can finally compute what this g plus dagger g plus gives when acting on the m vector. The g squared part gives us j times j plus one. And the minus gz squared minus gz part gives us negative m squared minus m, which can be rewritten as negative m times m plus one. Plugging this into our formula for alpha, we can pull all the scalar parts out in front, send the norm of m to one since it's normalized, and take the square root of this formula to get alpha. Technically, alpha could be a complex number with a complex phase, but we can choose a phase convention where alpha is always a real number. We can do something similar for g minus, where the only difference is a minus sign in the formula here, and this gives us a formula for beta. So finally, we now have the formulas for the alpha and beta coefficients for the raising and lowering operators, and these work in any dimension. I'm going to point out that, in the alpha formula, if we plug in m equals j, we get zero. This means that g plus cannot raise the j state. So j is the highest eigenvalue or highest weight. Similarly for beta, if we plug in m equals minus j, we get zero. So g minus cannot lower the minus j state. So minus j is the lowest eigenvalue or lowest weight. This means that in a given representation, the basis vector weights range from plus j to minus j in increments of one. 
This means that the highest weight j must be an integer or half integer. Otherwise, increments of 1 would mean that the highest and lowest weights would have different magnitudes, instead of equaling plus j and minus j, which is required. This also means that the dimension size n of the representation is always equal to 2j plus 1 for spin j. Since a highest weight of j implies there are 2j plus 1 basis eigenvectors. So we've covered a lot over the course of this video. We started with the three generators in the SU2 Lie algebra. Then we changed basis to g plus, g minus, and gz, and determined their commutation relations. We also found these eigenvalue relations for the operators, and we saw g plus and g minus raise and lower the eigenvector states according to the proportionality factors alpha and beta. And we determined these formulas for the various alpha and beta coefficients, which depend on their representation spin number j, and a vector's eigenvalue m. Now, in the case of the 2x2 two two representation, none of this gives us any new results that we didn't know before. The alpha and betas just end up being 1. But the important fact here is that the truth of these formulas does not depend on the dimension of the representation. We can use these formulas for the spin 1 case of 3x3 three three matrices, the spin 3 halves case of 4x4 four four matrices, the spin 2 case of 5x5 five five matrices, and so on. Let's try using all of this to build up the 3x3 three three spin 1 representation. Here we'll have three basis state vectors, which I'm going to label as plus 1, 0, and minus 1. The highest weight here is plus 1, so this is the spin value j. Also, keep in mind this vector labeled with 0 is not the 0 vector. It's just the label we're giving to this particular basis vector with eigenvalue 0. For the spin 1 case, we know that j equals 1. So j times j plus 1 equals 2. Now let's calculate these proportionality constants for the raising and lowering operators. For g plus acting on the minus 1 state, we sub in m equals minus 1, and get a constant of the square root of 2. And here the state is raised to the 0 state. For g plus acting on the 0 state, we sub in m equals 0, and we get a constant of the square root of 2 next to the 1 state. We can also check that g plus acting on the 1 state goes to 0. But this is expected since there are only three basis vectors, and we can't raise the highest weight vector to a higher one. We can also apply g minus to the three states to get coefficients of the square roots of two, except in the minus one state case where we get zero, since we can't lower it anymore. Recall, for a given matrix, we can get one of its entries using the appropriate row vector on the left to select a row, and the appropriate column vector on the right to select a column. This outputs the scalar entry for that row and column. We can do the same thing for our 3x3 three three g plus matrix, and get all nine of its entries using the various bras and kets on either side. Most of the entries go to zero, but a couple of them end up being the square root of two. These entries are used to raise the various state eigenvectors. We can do something similar with the g minus operator to get this 3x3 three three matrix. And also the gz matrix, but that's pretty obvious since all the eigenvalues are already on the diagonal. Now that we have matrices for g plus, g minus, and gz, we can use our change of basis equations to change back to the standard basis for generators of 3D rotations. These indeed give traceless anti-Hermitian matrices that we would expect from the SU2 Lie algebra. Now, this is a different 3x3 three three solution than the one we've seen in previous videos, but we can switch between these new ones and the more familiar 3x3 three three solution just by using a change of coordinates. The two solutions are equivalent. 
Now, if we want to see the spin 1 representation of the SU2 group, we just exponentiate the generator matrices in the Lie algebra to get these rotation matrices in the Lie group. Okay, so we saw that for the spin 1 representation of SU2, the procedure was to calculate the proportionality constants, then get G+, plus, G-, minus, and Gz as matrices, then switch back to the standard basis and get the SU2 Lie algebra generators. We can then exponentiate them to get the SU2 Lie group matrices. We can use this same procedure again for the spin 3 half representation of SU2, which uses 4x4 four four matrices. The four basis vectors would then be labeled with eigenvalues plus 3 halves, plus 1 half, minus 1 half, and minus 3 halves. The highest weight is 3 halves, so this is the spin 3 halves representation. I'd encourage you to pause the video and try finding the spin 3 halves SU2 Lie algebra representation before I give the answer. Calculating the proportionality constants is a bit more involved this time, but for Gz we get the square root of 3, 2, and the square root of 3. And for G minus we get similar results. This gives us the following G plus, G minus, and Gz matrices. Changing basis, we get these 4x4 generators. While exponentiating the GXY generator is easy, exponentiating the other generators is trickier, so I'm not going to do it in this video. I'll also show you the 5x5 solution for spin 2, so pause now if you want to try. The G plus proportionality constants are 2, the square root of 6, the square root of 6, and 2. And same for G minus. And we get these matrices for G plus, G minus, and Gz. And we can change basis to get these generators. Exponentiating the GXY generator, we easily get a 5x5 SU2 group matrix for doing rotations in the XY plane. In the convention used in this video, the XY generators and group matrices are always diagonal. Let's take a look at how some particles rotate in the XY plane under the SU2 group. Spin 0 particles transform with an identity matrix, so they don't change under rotations. For spin 1 half particles, we get two states, the spin up and spin down states whose complex coefficients change in opposite directions under this rotation. It's also worth noting that the one-half coefficients in the exponents mean the period of rotation is two full turns, or 4 pi. For spin 1 particles, we get three states. The plus 1 and minus 1 states correspond to classical waves that are left and right polarized around the z-axis and they take a full turn of 2 pi to get back to their starting point. The zero state corresponds to the longitudinal polarization along the z-axis, which does not change when we rotate around the z-axis, so it transforms with the constant 1. For massless spin 1 particles that travel at the speed of light, like photons, the longitudinal polarization is not possible so we only have the plus 1 and minus 1 states. For spin 3 half particles, we get 4 states. The plus and minus 1 half states have a period of 2 full turns, but the plus and minus 3 half states have a period of 2 thirds of a full turn. However, overall, the states collectively have a period of 2 full turns, or 4 pi. For spin 2 particles, we get 5 states, the zero state is constant under these rotations. The plus and minus one states have a period of one full turn, and the plus and minus two states have a period of half a full turn. Collectively, the states have a period of one full turn, or two pi. For massless spin two particles that travel at the speed of light, like the hypothetical graviton, the inner three states are not possible, so we only have the plus two and minus two states. Classically, gravitational waves come in two polarizations, the plus and cross polarizations, where the amplitudes move in and out along the directions of plus and cross shapes. 
The plus two and minus two states correspond to specific linear combinations of the plus and cross polarizations. These polarizations come back to themselves after half a full turn, so their period is half of 2 pi. Now, it can be confusing to tell the difference between the plus 1 state from the spin 1 representation and the plus 1 state from the spin 2 representation. For this reason, we often include the spin number j as a prefix label on the eigenstates. This helps us keep track of which eigenvector belongs to which representation. Now, it's a fact that there is exactly one irreducible representation of SU2 per dimension. If you find two different irreps of the same size, you can always swap between them using a change of coordinates. This happens because every SU2 Lie algebra irrep allows us to define the latter operators and assuming a finite dimensional representation, there will always be a highest weight vector j. We can then use the lowering operator to create an orthogonal basis for this irrep. So if we have two SU2 Lie algebra irreps of the same dimension, pi and pi tilde, each with different generators, we can always use their respective ladder operators to define an orthogonal basis for each representation. We can then use a change of basis matrix C to swap between these two bases. This means we can also change basis for any linear map L, and so we can always swap between the two SU2 generators using the same change of coordinates matrix C. The group representations of SU2 also use the same change of coordinate matrix C to change representations because of the properties of matrix exponentials. So we know that SU2 has exactly one irreducible representation per dimension. Now we'll prove that SO3 has only one irreducible representation for every odd dimension. This is a consequence of SU2 being the double cover of SO3. To prove this, we'll list a few facts. An important fact to remember is that a representation map rho will always send the identity element of a group to the n by n identity matrix. This is required to preserve the group multiplication rules. Now the double cover map phi from SU2 to SO3 sends the plus and minus versions of a given SU2 matrix to the same SO3 matrix R. As a result, the double cover map phi sends both the positive and negative 2 by 2 identity matrix to the 3 by 3 identity matrix. Now, if we have an irreducible representation rho of SO3, if we combine it with the double covering map phi, this automatically gives us an irreducible representation sigma of SU2. Since phi sends the negative identity to the identity matrix, and rho sends the identity to the identity, this means the induced map sigma sends the negative identity in SU2 to the identity matrix. Now let's look at the 4x4 and 5x5 irreps of SU2. We know there's only one irrep per dimension, and we already know that this 2x2 diagonal matrix gets sent to this 4x4 and 5x5 diagonal matrix, respectively. Now let's set theta to 2 pi. All the exponents with a half integer next to the angle will get sent to negative 1, since e to the i pi times an odd number is negative 1. And all the exponentials with integers next to the angle will get sent to plus 1, since e to the i 2 pi times an integer equals plus 1. So in the 4x4 irrep, the negative identity gets sent to the negative identity. And in the 5x5 irrep, the negative identity gets sent to the positive identity. More generally, for every even dimensional or half integer spin irrep, the negative identity is sent to the negative identity. But for odd dimensional or integer spin irreps, the negative identity is sent to the positive identity. Okay, let's bring this all together. We have the double cover map phi from SU2 to SO3, which sends the negative two by two identity to the three by three identity. 
And if we have an n by n irreducible representation of SO3, this will send the 3 by 3 identity to the n by n identity, as required by the rules of representations. This also induces an n by n irreducible representation sigma of SU2, which is the composition of phi and the SO3 irrep. As a result, this sigma always maps the negative 2 by 2 identity to the n by n identity. Now let's include the information from the last slide. If the dimension n is odd, the n by n irrep of SU2 will send the negative identity to the positive identity. This is consistent with what we have above, so there are no problems. But if the dimension n is even, the n by n irrep of SU2 sends the negative identity to the negative identity. This contradicts what we have above. The only conclusion we can draw is that there are no n by n irreducible representations of SO3 for even dimensional n. If there was, sigma would always send the negative identity to the positive identity, which is not the case for even dimensional irreps of SU2. So we've proven that SO3 only has irreps in odd dimensions, or equivalently for integer spins. Now, I'd like to move on to space-time, but before I do, I want to point out that it's possible to define representations for SU2 using polynomials and derivative operators, like this. These obey the expected commutation relations for SU2. We can prove this using these identities and various commutator properties that we've seen before. I don't know if these have an official name, but we could call them polynomial or differential representations. In quantum mechanics, these are usually defined with i h bar in front, and they generate rotation operations on wave functions. Now, we know that SU2 has one irreducible representation per dimension. But we know from the last video that SL2C in space-time has two non-equivalent 2x2 two two irreducible representations, which we call the left and right representations. We cannot change between these representations using a change of coordinates. We know that with the SU2 Lie algebra, if we complexify it with complex coefficients, we can define the raising and lowering operators which lets us define a given representation's highest weight, or spin value. With the SL2C Lie algebra, if we complexify it, we can break it up into the direct sum of a pair of complexified SU2 Lie algebras, each with their own spin values. So a given SL2C representation is defined by a pair of spin values, instead of just one. We saw this trick of breaking up complexified SL2C into a pair of complexified SU2s in the last video. So let's see how this works. We start by taking the SL2C rotation and boost generators, the J's and the K's, and change basis to the A's and B's. The only difference between the A's and B's is the sign in front of the K boost generators. These form two separate copies of the SU2 Lie algebras, which commute with each other. If we take each SU2 copy and complexify it so that they have complex coefficients, we can define raising and lowering operators and eigenvalue operators in each SU2 copy. This means we can label each SU2 representation with a highest weight or spin value. So this means that, to label a given irreducible representation of SL2C, we need to pick two spin values. We refer to the first spin value as left, and the second spin value, where the sign in front of the boosts is reversed, is called right. These spin values are often written in an ordered pair, like this. So for SU2 irreducible representations, we get a one-dimensional list of spin values. But for SL2C irreducible representations, we get a two-dimensional grid, which contains all possible pairs of left and right spin values. 
If we move from the Lie algebra SL2C to the Lie group SL2C, the irreps are also labeled by a pair of spin values. This time the irreps can be written as the tensor product of a left representation and a right representation. We get a similar 2D table of irreps for the Lie group SL2C. This contains the representations which transform scalars, left and right vial spinners, as well as space-time vectors. I'm not going to go into much more detail here because the next video will be all about the tensor products of representations. Dirac spinners transform with the direct sum of the left and right spin one-half representations, so this is a reducible representation.